Hello, everyone, and welcome to Coffee with Canon. Um, you know, we, we did a show last night with uh, really law enforcement superstar Gil Carrillo, a um, retired lieutenant from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office who, as a detective, caught the um, Night Stalker case, Richard Ramirez. We had to actually cut the show a little short. I don't think um, Gil was feeling well, and uh, I just uh, wanted to apologize to a, a lot of our um, listeners. Uh, Phil and I did our best. You know, when you do live um, YouTubes, uh, you get what you get, and you can't just stop and say, this is a do-over. You just got to keep uh, plowing forward, and that's what Phil and I attempted to do, and I hope that you guys um, somehow appreciated our efforts a little bit. But uh, I'm, I would love to have Gil Carrillo back on. I, I think just he, something went wrong. He wasn't feeling well. And I fully understand, and uh, I can't reiterate more. The guy's a superstar, and uh, you know we'll, we'll have him back on. Uh, thank you, Fuzzy Doxy. I appreciate that. Uh, Stratman, nineteen sixty Nick six. Hello, Bill. How are you, Gene Whitehead from the UK? How's the U is the UK as freezing as it is over here? I think yesterday it was fifteen. I don't know what the temperature is today, but it's pretty damn cold out there. If you know that, I'm not a winter guy either. You know. Although, you know, I always like to watch that show on TV, um, Life Below Zero, and it tells tales about people that live off the grid in Alaska. I mean, I like to watch it from the warmth of my bed and lay and watch it all from the warmth of sitting in front of a fireplace. But I can't imagine living that life. Like, you have to go out every day and chop down wood so you have heat for your house, for your cabin. They call it a cabin, you know. And you have to hunt to get your food. And you have to chop ice from the river <laughs> to get your water and to put some kind of uh, disinfectant in the water so it's safe to drink so you don't get sick. I mean, I could not imagine living that type of life. You know, I like to go to the grocery store and pick up my orange juice and uh, my tuna salad and stuff like that. And uh, if my house is cold, I turn up the heat a little bit and I pay those exorbitant heating bills. So I'm not chopping down trees, but... Not that there's anything wrong with that. Maybe that keeps you even healthier living off the grid because you have to live a, um, a, being very physical, you have to be ready to do really hard work, really hard labor, you know? Uh, so Phil and I were supposed to do a show today later on for the members. We're supposed to do a show called Cops in the Kitchen, and Phil's going to demonstrate how to make um, veal cutlet parmesan. I haven't heard from him yet, and I told him that I would, I was going to do a, a, try to do an earlier uh, coffee with Cannon. Lieutenant Pete's in the chat. Uh, th thanks, Lieutenant Pete. I, I really, you know, we tried our best. It was tough. Um, and I know that uh, Gil wasn't feeling well because I've spoken to him before on the phone. Phil says he's ready for cops in the kitchen. So uh, I'm not going to do a real long show today because we got to get into the kitchen. Phil even got himself a... Uh, a white chef's jacket. So he, he's serious about this stuff, you know? Um, so tomorrow night, um, you know, I, we can't help but have to cover this story with this new district attorney, Alvin Bragg. I and many people, we find it so outrageous what he's trying to do uh, by not prosecuting very serious crimes. You know, part of politics is, I guess, hey, Sammy DeFiglia, good to see you, Sam. Sam has been supporting us since the very beginning. He's a retired first grade detective. Sam, I really appreciate you. We were buddies years ago. We worked together in the same precinct back in the 20 precinct back in 85, 86. I can't even remember the years. Um, so getting back to uh, this DA Bragg, it, it's so outrageous. And, you know, part of politics is, and, you know, I, I, I like to put it straight, is to be a good liar. And he's lying. When he says that these policies of non-carceral, I love that new word, decarceration. And that means you don't want to put anyone in jail or prison. So somehow you're going to correct their behavior through other means, which is just not, it's not feasible in a city like New York. All the major cities that have tried this have failed, and they're the most dangerous cities across this country. Uh, Christo Cedar, firemen sound better for a cook chef. Is that a rumor? Mm -hmm. Well, look, firemen have to cook because they live in the firehouse, basically, and they all chip in X amount 
a week or a month, and that feeds them for the whole month. And it's like their home. They live there. Firemen get paid while they're sleeping. Cops don't. You know what I mean? And we don't get to. But a cop has to stay over at the precinct. Believe me, if you saw the accommodations, you would cringe. It's not much better than what a prisoner has at Rikers. <laughs> and, you know, when you when you first come on the police department and they say, oh, okay, you're going to work tonight to 2 o'clock in the morning, but I'm doing a day tour tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> that's your problem. Now, if you live way upstate and the drive is an hour and a half, you lose you lose three hours of sleep. Your other choice is to stay overnight in the dorm, in the precinct, or whatever unit you work in. And many cops, they live their life that way. They stay overnight a lot. The precinct is a second. But you don't get the same beautiful accommodations as many of the firehouses have in the city because, look, they live together. Uh, Gene Whitehead, Bill, I saw the show with Gil. He reminded me of my late husband who was a diabetic. He used to keep touching his head like Gil was when his sugar levels were low. Into a hypo. You know, Gene, that's very possible. I'm going to give him a call later on today and see if he's okay. Um, I That does not diminish my respect for that man. I have nothing but the utmost respect for him. You know, he actually does his own podcast. He's a co-host with a comic. Uh, the guy's name is George Lopez. He's a pretty famous comic. And... Um, Gil is the co-host of that podcast. So he's not a stranger to a podcast. So look, enough said about it. I the guy, the guy's ace is in my book. And I'm going to give him a call today and see how he's feeling. Getting back to the whole Alvin Bragg thing, we're getting actually some cases that you know it's almost timely cases that show that uh that this whole thing is not going to work. And and one of the biggest cases we had is up in East Harlem where a 19-year-old girl working at Burger King was murdered during a robbery. And that was after she handed the money over. I'm just going to play a little bit of this um, this news report on this 19-year-old cashier who was murdered up in the 25 Precinct East Harlem, because, not because of anything. She was because she was working there trying to make a living, whatever she was doing. Money that suspect made off with. But what's also shocking to the community is that police say when he shot the 19-year-old cashier, it was right before he left when the money was already in his possession. A vigil took place yesterday outside of that Burger King with family and friends for the victim, whose name is Crystal Bayron Nieves. Family and friends gathered to remember the 19-year-old calling for an end to the gun violence. NYPD clergy say the shooting is senseless and ask help from the public. We ask community, if they know something, if they saw something, let's get this mother some justice. Because if you think you got the right to shoot somebody, you don't. Look at this mother here. I was at the hospital and I was at her house a little while ago. This mother is hurting. Surveillance video is from inside that Burger King on East 116th Street near Lexington Avenue. The armed robbery happened at around 1245 in the morning on Sunday. And again, it's unclear how much money the suspect made off with. After suffering a gunshot to the stomach, Bayron Nieves was taken to Metropolitan Hospital where she was pronounced dead. And there's a $3,500 reward for any information leading to an arrest. You know, why does the news hop upon they don't know how much money was taken. What, what does that matter? How much money? What is it really? What does it matter? He shot and killed somebody. That's that's the major crime is a murder, not the robbery. Like, are you kidding me? They keep hopping. We well, don't know how much money was taken. Who cares? Who cares how much money was taken? But, you know, this is just a forebearer of, of what's to come. I can tell you, and uh, Phil Grimaldi could tell you, and other people that were on the job when we had broken window style policing, is that we weren't seeing these commercial stickups uh, with a shooting. Uh, we weren't seeing a lot of them. I'll say we'd see, you'd see them every once in a while, but you weren't seeing a lot of them. Another thing we weren't seeing almost any of was the, the crime carjacking. We're seeing that happen again. And it's like we had one the other night in Forest Hills. Forest Hills is a sleepy little sort of ritzy neighborhood in Queens. And we were not seeing carjackings. All of a sudden, carjackings are occurring again. Back when they were almost epidemic, it was like we were. Um, let me just cancel something here. It, it was. It was. 
ep- it was epidemic at one point, and it, it was really crazy. And they it was so crazy that they made carjacking a federal crime back in the day. Let me just play this little file tape here, and you're going to see what I'm talking about. So we're seeing crimes that more or less disappeared, probably because of the crime fighting um, techniques we used. Um, And now we're just, uh, we're seeing all these crimes happening again. You know, we're we're seeing carjackings. I'm sorry, you know, I forgot to bring my, is my sound sounding better right now? Philly Grimaldi said I was a little low. Um, So now we're seeing... um, these, these crimes that sort of disappeared uh, for a while. And um, it, it's a horror show because, as I said, this stuff stopped for a very long period of time. It, there were no carjackings anymore. There was no um, commercial stick-ups where a girl behind the counter was getting shot. I mean, just just outrageous. But all of these things are coming back now because of this these progressive policies and you know you see the different states that have the biggest crime problems are controlled by but let's say by democrats who believe in these woke decarceral policies where they don't want to put people in prison and they think of alternative means you know and i find that to be unacceptable because how about the person the john q public that is a crime victim does the crime victim matter there's something I want to talk about too. That and there's something called restorative justice. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that. When I used to teach college, I taught a course in corrections, and I never liked to teach that course, but I sometimes get to choose what courses I taught. And there's something in correctional. Um, you know, they talk about sanctions, sanctions, and there's something called restorative justice. And I'm going to read you the definition of it: a system of criminal justice that focuses on rehabilitation of offenders through reconciliation with victims and the community at large. So in essence, if you're a crime victim, say you were shot or you're a victim of a robbery, they want you to sit down next to the perp who robbed you or shot you and come to some kind of agreement with him that you're all going to feel better. You're going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya and He's going to be forgiven, and he's going to stay in the community. He's not going to be incarcerated. How does that work? How does that make any sense whatsoever? It makes no sense at all to me. These are the ideas that some of these woke people are coming but, And, you know, the very communities that are going to have the biggest problem with this are the communities of color. They have the highest crime. And they're the people that the working poor, they're the biggest victims of, of predator criminals like we see in this East Harlem stickup. I mean, just 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 outrageous. And the fact that they're suggesting something like th- this correctional philosophy, I just I just I just don't get it. I, I really every time you think it can't get any more outrageous, it gets more and more outrageous. You know, restorative justice. And then there's something called incapacitation. And that's the school that I come from. Incapacitation means you put someone in prison and they don't get out because they're being punished for their crime. It goes back to Hammurabi. Does anyone remember Hammurabi and his code? Yes, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's where I'm coming from, all right? If someone goes into a, a Burger King, robs the place, gets his money and shoots the cashier and kills her, that's calling for an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That guy deserves the death penalty, a commercial stick-up. Let's, let's say, a, for instance, what if he didn't shoot the girl? What if he just went into the bodega there? Oh, excuse me, the Burger King. Just He went into the Burger King, stuck it up, and left, but didn't hurt anybody. So he's a good robber. He's a nice robber, you know, a nice, nice robber, you know. And he doesn't, uh, he doesn't shoot anybody. 
but he takes the money and leaves. Now, with this new district attorney, he's going to prosecute that as a petty larceny. Outrageous, outrageous. I just, I just cannot, I cannot understand that. And it's it's just it's just too too amazing for me. Looking for the suspect who shot a 19-year-old Burger King worker to death during a robbery in East Harlem, even after the worker handed over the money. CBS 2's Alice Gaynor has the latest. A memorial grows outside the Burger King on 116th Street near Lexington Avenue, where 19-year-old cashier Crystal Bayron Nieves was shot and killed. Her distraught family spoke out today for the first time since the tragedy. Crystal didn't deserve this. She did not wake up thinking she wasn't going to make it back home. This is hurting our family so much, and we just want justice for her already. Police released these images of the robbery that happened just before 1 a.m. Sunday. They say the suspect entered demanding money. Bayron Nieves was shot in the stomach and died. Two other people were assaulted but are expected to be okay. People have been stopping at the memorial all day. Many didn't even know her but felt compelled to pay their respects. Just feel bad about it. I'm a parent also. So anytime you lose, whether there's a loved one or someone who could have just as easily been your daughter, <laughs> it's very tragic. Hopefully that our little man. You get these guys to do their job, man. Bring these guys to justice. Speaking of the new mayor, late Tuesday afternoon, Mayor Eric Adams joined Stand Against Violence East Harlem and her family outside the Burger King, which remains closed. The person who did this must be caught. And those who carry guns in my city, we're going to find you. You have an opportunity to go and get the services and be a part of these organizations and group and get your life together. You have an opportunity to not bring violence, but you will not use your condition as an excuse to take the life of a 19-year-old. We will no longer tolerate any acts of violence in our community. We are working diligently to reduce all shootings throughout our city. The new NYPD commissioner was also here with Adams as well. So far, there have been no arrests in the case. If you know anything, give police a call. In East Harlem. You know, stand against violence, East Harlem. I think that's the new part of the criminal justice system, too. It's like, shouldn't the police be all over that? Stand Against Violence East Harlem. Those are what they call violence interrupters. Those people are getting paid. There's public funds going to them. Is that effective? No, the police should be out on this 100%. They should be forefront of this, not Stand Against Violence East Harlem. Who are these people? These are ideas that are also coming from the wokeness and the left of, oh, we're going to pay these people that live in the community to get people and give them services so they don't get violent. I just do not understand this stuff. Once you get violent like that, how many people in the chat right now want to bet that when they capture, when they get this guy and they will get him, that he's going to be a recidivist, that he may be even be out on parole, that he may even have taken five or six or seven arrests last year. So who are we kidding? This is all crap, and I'm really getting annoyed with it. And there's this whole woke thing. Oh. Stand against violence, East Harlem. How? What training do these people have? You know, some of these people are former criminals themselves. And what is that? Is that going to stop crime? Is that going to make it take an effect on on violence? No. You think the two carjackers in Forest Hills? They they they're transient robbers, and they're going to shoot people in different neighborhoods. You know, that's a police problem. All right. It's not a problem for social workers. When someone pulls out a gun and, you know, tomorrow night at 9 p.m., Thursday night, uh, 1-13-2022, at 9 p.m., I'm going to have former ADA Dan Bibb, who was a a superstar ADA with the Manhattan DA's office, a great prosecutor. He's now a defense attorney. He's an, an outstanding attorney. He's going to weigh on weigh in on this this whole Alvin Bragg thing. What I don't understand is okay, Alvin Bragg, yes, he got elected. The the crazy electorate of New York City elected this guy. It, 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 do they want him to do what he's doing? I know a lot of people now when they're hearing this they're like, "Oh my god, what did we do?" 
is it his is it his decision not to prosecute robbery first degrees when someone points a gun at someone if no one's hurt i find that to be outrageous that's not what the law says the law says you you point a gun at someone and, and remove property that's a robbery first degree and you're eligible to do 12 to 25 years in state prison how does he decide I'm not going to incarcerate people for that. There was just a case down in the village where this robber, a homeless-looking robber, goes in, steals $2,000 worth of, uh, I don't know, some kind of medicine, whether it was Tylenol or whatever, $2,000 worth. And they go to grab me, pulls out scissors and menaces security with scissors. Guess what? That's a robbery first degree. Guess what? Bragg refused to prosecute it. He made it a pettit larceny. Is that outrageous? Is it, why do we care so much about this homeless psycho's uh, proclivity to do robberies with scissors and not the victims? How about the store owner? You know, from what I understand, and I don't know if this is common knowledge, but a group of high-end stores of the owners or the CEOs of stores went this week, this week, to Congress as they want something done about these smash and grabs. It's like open season. Come on in. You want to steal stuff? Come on in. We're not going to stop you. In fact, the government is welcoming you to do this because we're going to make it a pettit larceny. So I just cannot understand how we got here. How did we get here? How did we get uh, Ryan Sanford? I live in Texas. Trust me, all of the big cities here have liberal mayors and Soros. DA Houston is going through the same garbage as New York City. Well, I don't know if you guys realize this, um, uh, but Soros, uh, George Soros donated $1 million to the election campaign for Alvin Bragg. I mean, to tell you the truth, I think that that level of donation should be illegal. And the left and the right have both done it. The Koch brothers used to donate millions of dollars to candidates. Uh, I think Bloomberg has donated millions of dollars for, for the um, election for Congress in Georgia. It was either Congress or Senate. And he affected that, that race. Why do wealthy people get to affect the outcomes of elections? That's not democracy. You know, that's... The highest bidder gets to uh, see who's going to get elected, you know. Um, Eva Veden, how was he allowed to? Well, the, the election laws don't prohibit that. They do not prohibit that. Uh, so it is it is somewhat outrageous. Not somewhat, it is outrageous. Uh, I'm going to pull play a little bit of uh, Alvin Bragg here, and uh, we're going to see what he's, what he's all about. I think we already know what he's all about. but. Uh, to actually see it and, and the pushback that we're getting from some conservative or Republican senators is uh, is all over the place. God. Do not charge people with serious crimes. He's only been in office for 10 days and already there are calls for Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg to step down or be removed. Pro-criminal, anti-cop, anti-public safety. There's been so much misinformation. There are people that do not want this to succeed. The controversy began last week when Bragg sent out this memo to assistant district attorneys in Manhattan. Bragg informed prosecutors they should no longer seek jail or prison time for many low-level crimes and for some robbery, assault, and gun possession cases where no other crimes are involved. Exactly. Well, Alvin Bragg, stop hugging the thugs and start prosecuting the thugs. Exactly. That's your job. Today, two Republican candidates for governor, Congressman Lee Zeldin and Andrew Giuliani, both held press conferences saying D.A. Bragg will leave the streets of Manhattan less safe. D.A. Alvin Bragg is refusing to do his job and enforce the law, so Governor Kathy Hochul needs to do her job and remove the district attorney of Manhattan. District Attorney Bragg spoke with our political talk show, Picks on Politics, trying to set the record straight, saying his office will be focused on sending violent people to jail and not people who need help. If you are uh, suffering from addiction or mental health uh, and you commit a low-level crime, we're going to get you the services you need. We're not going to incarcerate you. And on the issue of violent crime, 
Bragg insisted it's his top priority. You hit a law enforcement officer, you're going to be prosecuted. That's very serious. I have prosecuted armed robbery throughout my career. You go into a store with a gun and rob it, we're going to prosecute that. You know something, there's no misinformation because I have it right here. I have his eight-page memo. So there's no misinformation. Maybe how it's being reported, but he, he absolutely states his position and how he's not going to prosecute uh, certain things. Resisting arrest against a police officer. For the, for the most part, he's not going to prosecute that. And he'll come out and say, oh, I never said that. If someone punches a cop in the face, he's using the most extreme instances. How about when someone flails their arms and refuses to be handcuffed? Is that resisting arrest? In my book, it is. But guess what? Alvin Bragg will not prosecute that. I would like to see some of these politicians make these arrests. They'll not prosecute um, 511 of the VTL, which means unlicensed operator of a motor vehicle, which also a lot of times when you pull criminals over, none of them have licenses. So you don't want to prosecute that so that they're allowed to drive around the streets of the city with impunity? Do you think if they have no license, you think they have insurance? Of course not. Of course they don't have insurance. So what happens when they hit a family of four and kill three of them? What, what satisfaction of good citizens of this country, of this city, of this state getting when some mope driving a car with a suspended license, multiple suspensions, hits you? And he, he's not going to prosecute that either. So, I mean, he's got to stop because he's lying. He's not going to pro- – the old thing that we've hopped on a lot of times uh, is um, jumping the turnstile, which we always found to be uh, – that should be a theft of service misdemeanor. He's not going to prosecute that anymore. So part of the legal reason that the police want that to be prosecuted is because someone jumps the turnstile. They have something called search incidental to lawful arrest. They arrest that person. They could search him. For a gun, lo and behold, they're recovering many guns from these turnstile jumpers. When there's a heinous crime on the subway, what percentage do you think of the criminals that commit these crimes pay their fare? What percentage? Almost none. When they take a poll to that, they're jumping the turnstiles with impunity. So uh, it's outrageous. And you know something? When he talks about services for mentally ill, you know, that's almost like a chicken or the egg story. Are, are criminals criminals because they're mentally ill or are they mentally ill because they're criminals? Because many of the people that are predators in the subway are mentally ill. They're alcoholics. They're drug addicts, right? But they are mentally ill. So do we not charge them for heinous crimes because they're mentally ill? No, they deserve a jail cell, in my opinion. In my opinion, they deserve a jail cell or a prison cell. You want to use that as part of their penalty or as part of the sanctions? Yes, you're getting this amount of time in jail, but we'll reduce the amount of time you're in jail if you if you do this, if you go to counseling, if you go to drug counseling, if you go to alcohol counseling. That's what parole and probation are. But don't just sell the farm before anyone even made a payment toward it. That's outrageous. It's like there is no there's no teeth in the law if you do that. You know, people, the sanctions have to be of the nature that people are going to be afraid to violate the law, that they're going to be punished. There has to be punishment. If there's no punishment, it's, you know, what reason does anyone have not to commit crimes? These stores, these CVSs, they're going to start moving out of cities. They're going to start moving out of these Cities that don't prosecute these career, or as they would call them, pettit larcenists, but they're actually, they're robbers. This guy was a robber that stole $2,000 worth of merchandise from a CVS and then produced scissors when he was caught. That's, that's called a robbery then. And that specific case was pled down by Bragg's office. They didn't want to charge robbery, charge it as a pettit larceny, you know. Uh Right, exactly. You know, part of private enterprise is that if you don't make a profit, guess what? You go out of business. So when these criminals go into these stores and just help themselves to whatever they want and there's no prosecution, there's no teeth in the law, it's it's just going to build on itself. You just produced 10 more 
pettit larcenist with a scissor because there's no teeth, there's no punishment. I mean, you know, how many, I would like to know, I'd like to see the MTA report on how much money they're losing a year from turnstile jumpers. How much are they losing? Because the police, they can't, they really can't, you know, they, why are they going to make an arrest? There's no, there's no punishment for it. Are they going to write a summons? You think this person's going to answer to the summons? It's just, yeah, uh, Jen Lowe, it is encouraging criminals. Folks, if you're not subscribed to Police Off the Cuff, Coffee with Cannon, whatever you want to call it, please go to our YouTube, hit the subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, ring that bell. We also have a Patreon, and we uh, I just had two new people join yesterday. I was so happy. You know, I go to I go to I look at the Patreon. This is like a, actually a funny story, and um, I see someone dropped out. I go, ah, that sucks. I lost the per-. and I I look and it's my son. I call him on the phone. I go, are you kidding me? I go, you dropped out. He was at the lowest level too. He was paying seven dollars a month. I go, I paid for your college. I just gave you a car, and you're dropping out of my Patreon. Oh, I just you know. I just joined in the beginning when, you know, when you guys were starting out. I thought, uh, I go, what do you mean? Seven bucks a month? You can't afford it? It's almost funny. It's actually, if I was still doing stand-up comedy, it would be a funny bit, you know? <laughs> yeah, Christo C, though. Yeah, it is funny. And he's not, he's not a kid. He's going to be 30 years old. I'm like, you can't afford seven bucks a month? You pulled out of my Patreon? <laughs> yeah, uh, with Ann Griffin, it is funny. It actually is hilarious. That, those are your kids, right? I only paid... Between him and his brother, I only paid about $350,000 for the college education, you know. Well, my wife and I, not, not me by myself. But so that's why I find it funny. Oh, Jenlo, you're giving him an excuse. It's expensive in Denver. He needs that seven bucks. He, he, he needs that. What is it? What is seven? He needs the $84 a year now that uh, he's not contributing to my um, Patreon. <laughs> Just sticking up for him. Uh, I'll tell him he, he had some people. He had some people in the chat that actually was sticking up for him. Crazy. So again, um, tomorrow night, uh, Thursday night at 9 p.m., we're going to have Dan Bibb on, an outstanding former Manhattan district attorney. Uh, we're going to talk about the same subject. We're going to go into a little more depth as to why this is a horrendous idea. Um, I believe um, the new police commissioner, uh, Commissioner Sewell, she had a meeting with Alvin Bragg, but it seemed like it, you know he's not going to change his mind. Uh, unfortunately, it seems like he's bought and paid for by this whole progressive movement. You know, the people that suffer through this are the people that are living in the inner city communities. They suffer the most, but so do people living on Park Avenue. The people that, you know, we call them limousine liberals, you know, they're going to suffer too when they have someone sticking a gun in their face and relieving them of their Rolex. All of that stuff is coming. I'm excited today to, after I get off the air today, I'm doing a, um, I'm doing a cooking show with Phil called Coppers in the Kitchen with restaurant tips. Phil lets me know that too. So we're going to, uh, we're going to video that today. I'm going to put it out there just for our YouTube and our Patreon subscribers. Maybe my son will re up and pay seven dollars a month once he sees there's some new, there's some new coppers in the kitchen show. You know, I doubt it, but uh, he he may do that. Uh, hello, Anna. Good to see you, Anna Shipilovskaya. I don't know if I said that right. Shipilovskaya. Shipil- wow, that's a tough. That's a Russian name, I would imagine, right, Anna? Difficult to say. Uh, crazy. Stratman 66, Biden is killing my fixed income, Sergeant Bill. Yeah, it's things have gone up, right? Uh, things have gone up. Everything's going up. You know, guys, I'm at um, almost 35 minutes. I just wanted to do a quick hit to say hello to all you guys. Uh, uh, give a little bit of apology for last night, uh, even though, as I said, uh, um, uh, Gil Carrillo is still aces in my book. And... Um, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. This whole the whole world's crazy right now, you know. But anyway, I just wanted to say hello. Coffee with Cannon. Oh, I forgot to show my police off the cuff mug, which I do all the time. There we go, police off the cuff. And of course, our motto, our dipped in butter motto. So you can get that merchandise on our on our police off the cuff 
the Police Off the Cuff uh, website, policeoffthecuff.com. That's where we have our, our merchandise. Uh, Reigns, the whole world is crazy because of the leftist period. You know, I sort of feel that I can't, I can't, you know, you got to say who's doing it. And, you know, it's being done by, um, by progressives. And they, they, they're trying this whole new model of, of called uh, Scotty Wagner. Yeah, we were talking about the shopping cart killer. And F- Fuzzy Doxy, thank you for the 499 Super Chat. Scotty Wagner had one of the cases that went you know, a serial killer in East Harlem back in 1997. His name was Aaron Key. And Scotty Wagner had one of those cases in that uh, he was also called the shopping cart killer before the shopping cart killer in Virginia. Folks, I'm going to say goodbye right now. I just wanted to say uh, hello to everyone. Coffee with Cannon. I'm going to be signing out. I want everyone to be safe. and God bless. And come see us uh, tomorrow night at 9 p.m. with uh, retired ADA Dan Bibb. Thanks again. Have a great day.